Alrighty, let's do one more video on the second derivative test. Um, I explained it to you last time. Uh, despite the name and the thought that, you know, because it deals with the second derivative, and since everything that deals with the second derivative is about concavity, that the second derivative test should be about points of inflection. But it's not, okay? That's the hardest part. The hardest part is getting over that, and when you hear second derivative test, thinking extrema. It is a way of analyzing critical values from your first derivative, okay? Well, let's go ahead and jump right in with an example. I have y is equal to x plus 4 over x, which might, of course, you know, be a little bit easier to deal with if it were actually put in that form. So I have y prime is equal to 1 minus 4x to the negative 2, or 1 minus 4 over x squared, which of course is x squared minus 4 over x squared. My critical values are going to be x is equal to plus or minus 2. Now, I also have a point at which the derivative is undefined at 0, but remember, that value is also disallowed in the original function. It's not part of the original domain. Uh, so even though, like, if we were doing a sign chart, we would have to include x is equal to zero as a break in the domain, uh, but we would not, at least, I don't, I don't know if other teachers, I mean, I, I've never designated it as a critical value. It's just, it's not that important. It has to actually be a, in order to be a critical point, it actually has to be a point on the curve, and if it's not even in the domain, then it doesn't qualify as far as I'm concerned. So let's go ahead and do the second derivative, and we're going to go ahead and go straight from this form right here. Uh, we know that that winds up being 8x to the negative 3, or 8 over x cubed. Okay, well, let's go ahead and evaluate y double prime of negative 2. It's going to be 8 over negative 8, or negative 1, which is less than 0. You have y prime of 2 is going to be 8 over 8. That's equal to 1. That's greater than 0. So if it's negative, it's concave down. Okay, and if it's positive, it's concave up. Now, if it's concave down, the second derivative test reveals anything that's concave down is going to have a maximum point, right? That's a maximum point if it occurs in an interval that's concave down. So negative 2, when I plug it into here, I'm going to get negative 2 minus 2, right? So negative 2, negative 4. So negative 2, negative 4 is your maximum, okay? Now anything that occurs in a concave up, a critical value that occurs in a concave up interval is of course going to be a minimum value. And if I plug in 2, I'm going to get 2 plus 2 or 4, so 2, 4 is a minimum value. You're like, hey, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. That looks like a minimum. That looks like a maximum. But you got to remember that maximum and minimum have to do with their relatives. I mean, they're, they're relative. They're local. You're not saying that this is the absolute maximum. You're just saying that with respect to the area immediately in its vicinity, that is the maximum value. It's the highest value. And the same thing for this one. Okay. So, I mean, if we actually go and look at this function, it actually looks something like this, and we actually do see that at negative 2, negative 4, we have a maximum right here, and then at 2, 4, we have a minimum right here. And the second derivative test has actually very clearly uh, and very accurately told us the nature of those zeros, I mean of those critical values. Well, I mean they're zeros of a sort, they're zeros of the, of the derivative. Okay, well, I think that we would kind of we kind of be in a little bit of trouble if we didn't go ahead and do something that was trig related. Um, <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and do that one. Okay, f of x is equal to two sine x plus cosine two x. We're going to evaluate that on zero to two pi. Okay, now if that's the case. Then we have f prime of x is equal to 2 cosine x 
minus 2 sine 2x. And of course, we know, uh, at least we should know, uh, that that can be transformed into that, which can be transformed into that, which gives me critical values where cosine of x is equal to 0 or sine x is equal to 1 half. Now, cosine of x is equal to 0 where? Well, it happens at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And sine x is equal to 1 half at pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. Now I need to take those critical values, I mean these are the critical values for the function, that's where the first derivative is equal to 0, and I need to analyze them according to the second derivative. Well, let's go ahead and take this second derivative, and we're going to take it here from it in, it in you know, uh, term by term form, and it winds up being negative 2 sine x uh, minus 4 cosine 2x. Okay, well, yeah, that's not exactly the most convenient, but the thing is that we don't actually have to do anything with that except for evaluate, okay? And since we only have to evaluate, and we know the points at which we evaluate, let's go ahead and get started. Let's just go left to right in terms of the critical values that we've, that we've arrived at. That winds up being negative 2 sine pi over 2 minus 4 cosine of pi, right? Because when you plug in pi over 2, it gets multiplied by the 2 and becomes pi. So negative 2, okay, sine of pi over 2 is what? Well, sine of pi over 2 is 1, okay? So that makes that term negative 2. Cosine of pi is negative 1, so that becomes plus 4. So that's 2, which makes that positive. So I have, if that is concave up, pi over 2 is a minimum value, okay? I have a minimum at x is equal to pi over 2. Well, let's keep going. f double prime of 3 pi over 2. Well, that's negative 2 sine 3 pi over 2 minus 4 cosine of 3 pi. Well, sine of 3 pi over 2 is going to be negative 1, okay? negative 1 times a negative 2 is positive 2. Now 3 pi is coterminal with pi, so its cosine value is identical. And that's going to be 6. That's positive as well, meaning that it's concave up. And of course, if a critical value occurs in an interval that is concave up, it's a minimum. All right, let's keep going. f double prime pi over 6, and of course that's the third critical value, and that came from the sine x is equal to 1 half. Um, and so there we have negative 2 sine of pi over 6 minus 4 cosine of pi over 3. Remembering that when we plug it in, that angle measurement gets doubled. It goes from pi over 6 to pi over 3. Now, sine of pi over 6 We've already figured that out, okay? Because that's where we got the pi over 6 from. That's 1 half. So 1 half times negative 2 is negative 1. Now, cosine of pi over 3 is going to be positive 1 half. Positive 1 half times a negative 2, I mean times a negative 4, is going to be a negative 2. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. Negative 3, that's negative, and therefore it's going to be concave down in that interval, and we have a max at pi over 6, okay? Now, this is obviously a little bit cumbersome, and you know, you're thinking to yourself, well, why didn't I just use a first derivative sign chart and just evaluate it from there? And in this case, you might actually be right. It might actually be a little bit less work, but then again, we're not doing this uh, for less work. We're actually doing this so that we understand it such that we can use it when we need it. 
and you will need it on the AP exam. There are, there are problems uh, that require the use of the second derivative test in order to determine a maximum or, or, or a minimum, which is entirely the reason why I didn't just do one video, I did two. You're gonna wanna come back to this one. Now sine of five pi over six, again, one half, so that's negative one. Cosine of five pi over three is gonna be the same cosine measurement as pi over three because it's down in the fourth quadrant. So that's minus two, so that's negative three, and that winds up being negative. You have a maximum at x is equal to five pi over six, okay? Well, let's go ahead and uh, try and uh, put that into the calculator. I'll try to do it as fast as I can so you don't have to sit there and uh, wait for me too much. Okay, well, I went ahead and put, like I said, that into y1, okay? Uh, let's go ahead and go to the window and let's do zero to two pi, since that is the interval that we've been given. And let's go ahead and go negative two uh, to two, and let's go ahead and graph. Okay, actually, I need to go back to the window and I need to do what the scale is, okay? Let's do pi divided by six. So each hash mark is pi over six. Well, pi over six should be a maximum, and it is. Three pi over six is the same thing as pi over two, that should be a minimum, and it is. Five pi over six should be a maximum according to our analytic work, and it is. And over here at three pi over two, and I didn't actually give you enough room along the y, but you can see that it's going to be a minimum down here. So my graph, gives me exactly the same information that my second derivative sign chart did. And if I'm asked for the points, all I would do is take pi over two, three pi over two, pi over six, five pi over six, plug it back into the original, get the corresponding outputs in order to get the ordered pairs that I require, okay? That, guys, is basically the second derivative test. It winds up being really, really straightforward. Like I said, once you get it out of your head that everything about the, everything about the second derivative has to do with concavity or points of inflection. Um, be on the lookout for some videos on optimization problems. Um, this is another one of those really neat sections that I actually really enjoy. Uh, but because it doesn't show up on the AP exam all that often, and when it does, the problems are rather underwhelming, this is a section that a lot of teachers go over very, very quickly. They give it sort of minimal treatment, uh, but I'll try and give you a little bit more robust uh, treatment. I don't know exactly how many videos there will be, but they'll be coming down the pike here pretty soon, so be on the lookout for those. See ya.